Hi, this is Rhett with TestingTheory.com, and today I want to talk to you about the sneaky little trap of the rate of action that is used with analytics. We'll talk about what a rate of action is, how rate of actions can be damaging in analysis, and what you need to understand to make them really great to use them to your advantage. Many years ago, I was an analytics consultant at Adobe, and I had the analytics data of hundreds of the major websites in the, in the industries. And as I looked at these clients' data, they wanted one thing for me. They wanted me to analyze their data, and they wanted me to come back with recommendations of how they can improve their site to make their data actionable. So I did it. I would go in and I would look at the data and I would do all kinds of segmentation and run all kinds of reports and put them in dashboards and, and filter all this data. And I would come back with presentations and the presentations would say, would say things like this. Here, we found this, this insight because this rate of action was low here or high here, and you can improve your site by doing these things. And at the end of the day, in retrospect, I look that back on that, on that now and I kind of cringe a little bit because I realized that I was making recommendations on rates of action. And the recommendations I was making probably weren't the best because I didn't have other tools in my toolbox to give them better recommendations. Now, it wasn't that my analysis was bad or the, the things I was saying that you wouldn't get with an analytics consultant today, but there's just better ways to use the data. Today, I want to talk to you about how these rates of actions are important to understand and how if, if misused, you potentially are recommending things that, that aren't valuable. So let me give you a simple example to help understand what a rate of action is and what I'm talking about. So if I show you a page that has a list of things that people can select and there's some filters at the top, and I say 40% of the people on this page are using filters. The 40% is the rate of action. It's the rate at which they are doing something. So whenever I say rate of action, that's just a rate that people are doing something. It can be the rate they're converting. It can be the rate that they're watching something. It's the rate that they're doing or taking some action. That's why we call it a rate of action. Now on this same page, suppose that I were to tell you that of the 40% of people that are filtering, 80% of them click something on the page. So now in this simple analysis, you have two rates of action. You have the 40% that are uh, using filters, and then you have the 80% of those people that use filters who then take the next action and click something on the page. So in my previous life, I might have taken this simple example and said, look, we know that filters are important because 80% of the people that use filters are taking the action of clicking something on the page. However, only 40% of people are using filters in the first place. So I might recommend something like, hey, you need to get more people using filters. You need to make them bigger, you need to put more of them, you need to make them more prominent. And so that might be the recommendation, but this recommendation is flawed for two very important reasons, because a rate of action can never tell you a couple important things. When using analytics data, a rate of action is usually never causal data, and also it's never, it doesn't have a comparable reference. These are the two things you need to, to get the most out of your data. You need a comparable reference and you need causal data. And I wanna to talk to you about these two things and how they tie into a rate of action. There's a simple flaw in this recommendation that you need to make the filters more prominent. The flaw is that I'm assuming causation. When I say that you can get more people filtering and clicking through if you make the filters more prominent, the, the causal assumption is that the filters are causing people to click through. And if you get more people filtering, that you'll get more people clicking. So that's the correlation there. The end click through is not caused by the number of people filtering. Just because I increase people filtering, that doesn't mean I'll increase the number of people clicking through. Again, there's no causation here. So I hope you see the subtlety of this trap. Just because you have two rates of action, first of all, they're not causal unless it's part of a test. And second of all, you need something to compare them to. So let's talk about more of these two things, comparison and causality. If I were to say 80% of the people using filters are clicking through, you might initially respond with, that's great. The problem is a rate of action never tells you if it's good or bad. It just is. 80% is only good or bad if you have something to compare it to. If I told you your competitor's site was at 99% and you were at 80%, now you think that's bad. 80% is not as good as it looked. If on the other hand, I told you your competitor's site was only 10% and yours was at 80%, you're like, wow, we're doing amazing. That comparison, that comparison is what helps you know if something's good or bad. A rate by itself, a correlative rate pulled from analytics data does not tell you if it is good or bad. It just is. A rate of action just is. There's no good or bad until you have something to compare it to. The challenge though is that there are good comparisons and there are lazy comparisons. The good comparison obviously is an A-B test where you're comparing 
a specific rate of action of one variable change to the, the rate of action of that same variable changed. That's a very strategic, very great way to do a comparison. But as lazy humans, we don't always take the effort and the time to run A-B tests and multivariate tests. Instead, we do other things to compare. A few more examples of lazy comparisons. We've already talked about comparing two correlative analytics data points. That happens all the time, and it's just lazy because it's not causal. Um, other things that people do is they compare their rates of action to the industry averages or to other websites or to their own experience or they just compare that to their own ideas of what they think is good or bad. Because a rate of action is neither good nor bad, people naturally tend to start to compare this rate to other things that they're familiar with, like we talked about, the industry or their websites or their own experience, because they need that comparable data point to help them know if it's good or bad. But really, the best and most strategic way to compare is through an A-B test. Okay, so that's the first most important point, that a rate of action is neither good nor bad, and you have to have a comparable data point to know if it is good or bad. The other thing that you have to have is causal data. For your rates of action to matter at all, you have to have causal data showing how that rate is comparable to a different rate. So again, think back to my example, the 40% rate of people clicking through and the 80% rate of people using filters that click through. Those two rates are independent of each other. They don't cause each other. If you increase the amount of people filtering, that doesn't mean you will increase the number of people clicking through. Those rates are independent, correlated data points, and they're not causal. So many of you know to get causation is simple. All you have to do is run an A-B test or a multivariate test. Once you have that as a test, you now have causal data because one rate or one thing is causing that change. It's the cause and effect rule. And once that change is causal, now you have a great comparable data point for your rate of action. When I was an analytics consultant at Adobe and I would do this analysis and I would find different rates that, they, that I would propose that they can make changes to optimize their site, I wish back then I had the toolbox of optimization and testing to be able to say, hey, I found this rate, and because of this rate, I have these ideas. These, these ideas come from this rate, but they are not interrelated. So I want you to run a test to see if we can change this rate by making these changes on the website in a test. That's the magic of A-B testing. When you run an A-B test, you get those two things. You get comparable data points in the, the world of causation. And with those two things, your rates of action now become so actionable and so valuable. So beware of using rates of action by themselves. Beware of using them without comparable data points. Beware of using them without causation because those rates of action are correlation and not causation. Thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me that thumbs up so I know that you liked the video. You can also visit me at testingtheory.com where you can learn more testing strategies, where you can sign up for a free consulting session with me, and where you can learn more things to help you get better testing and more conversions.